Cool. Thank you so much, Eric, and thank you all for being here. I want to give a very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for coming out to HashiConf US 2019 in Seattle. Uh, this is sort of personally very exciting for me. Uh, Seattle's actually my hometown. Grew up not far from here. Uh, and in many ways, it's sort of the spiritual origin uh, of HashiCorp itself. So I'm not sure that you know, that many people actually know the origin story of HashiCorp, uh, but it really actually started in some sense at the University of Washington, just sort of a few miles off from here. Uh, both me and Mitchell enrolled at the University of Washington uh, in 2007, and I think it was sort of obvious to both of us coming in that you know, we loved infrastructure, we loved sort of uh, you know, computer science as sort of a whole, it was sort of a passion uh, even before we got there. And it, so it was through, you know, in some sense, a bit of happenstance that we ever met. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly large school, but I think both of us were sort of drawn to a lot of the same sort of topics in terms of, you know, not only how do you write the software, I think we were both interested in that, but, you know, in some sense, we both came to it from a bit of a system administration background. So we were interested in how do you actually manage this stuff? How do you deploy it? How do you actually think about sort of the system administration side of software, not just the authoring? And so we both happened to end up on the same research project. Uh, you know, called the Seattle Project aptly, but good luck ever Googling for that. Um, and it was on this project that we were sort of working on the same component and really got to meet each other and find out that, wow, we really do share a bunch of interests in terms of, you know, what now is sort of HashiCorp. Uh, in the meantime, we formed sort of a bit of a uh, startup working group and worked on a number of different ideas, everything from sort of a digital pet store to a point of sale to a you know, how do you buy textbooks online for college students? And so there was a long list of failures before we, uh, before we ever got to HashiCorp. So, you know, it's personally very exciting, I think, for both me and Mitchell to be here, and very thankful that you're all able to join us. For those who've maybe not been to HashiCorp before, or for those of you who've been to HashiCorp before, you might notice that this one's a bit larger than they've been uh, in the past. Uh, today we have a little bit over 1,600 people joining us. Uh, that's probably a good 500 people more than we had last year. And it's from 570 different organizations. We have 360 different cities, 28 countries, and six continents represented here. So we're gonna work on that last continent for next year. <laughs> and so today we are, not just today, today and tomorrow, we have an amazing set of lineup of talks for you. We have four different tracks. We have over uh, two dozen different talk sessions for you. There's an amazing set of speakers representing an awesome set of companies. So I encourage you, go to as many of these sessions as you can, learn about the best practices, get their shared experiences, talk to the speakers afterwards. I know there's a lot kind of going on here, especially with four tracks, so all the talks will be recorded. So if you can't make up your mind between which talk you want to go to at any given time, pick one, don't worry, we're going to record and share the rest after the conference, so you won't miss out. One of our goals with events like this is to make them as diverse and inclusive as possible. We want to get a broad range of people who bring different backgrounds, different perspectives, different experiences. And there's a set of underrepresented folks who can't get here, sometimes because of financial sponsorship, sometimes just because you know, uh, you know, their corporate group won't pay for their trips. And so one of the things we've focused on is the HashiCorp Diversity Scholarship to bring folks who are sort of traditionally un underrepresented at events like this and bring them out here. So, among the group, you're gonna have people from all around the world who are joining us for this. Uh, please use this as an opportunity to meet new people and uh, you know, break out of the folks you maybe talked to last year. What's exciting for us is when we talk about sort of the global HashiCorp community, it's been sort of crazy to watch the community grow, particularly from the lens of the HashiCorp user groups. This is an initiative we launched only a few years ago uh, with one or two groups. Uh, and just this week, we crossed the sort of 25,000 user mark within the HashiCorp user groups. So that represents something like 110 different groups from 44 different countries around the world. If you haven't joined one in your local neighborhood, I encourage you to seek it out and do so. If there isn't one and you want help starting it, please reach out to us and we're happy to help you get that going. One of our goals when we talk about sort of HashiCorp, HashiConf, and in general, the sort of broader community, is how do we bring everybody together to do this sort of knowledge sharing and discovery? Right? I think for, all, for many of us, these are relatively new topics. We're just getting into whether it's infrastructure as code or security or service networking. And so it's important for us to be able to sort of learn from each other, right? just as much as it is from events like this. And so the challenge is while we can get you know, a few thousand people at our different events, that's only a small fraction of the whole community. So one of the things we launched over this last year was 
the community portal, and the community forum. And our goal was to take the sort of splintered conversation that we had on Twitter and Reddit and Stack Overflow and our mailing list and sort of all over the place and bring it into one place that's searchable and indexed and bring the HashiCorp employee community there as well. So on the forum, you'll actually engage not only with your fellow community members, but also developer advocates and engineering teams and product community within HashiCorp. So if you haven't seen this yet, uh, you can get to the community portal at just community.hashicorp.com and sign up and start participating. So with the growth of the user community itself, we've been sort of struggling on our side in some sense to keep up with that growth. Last year, we were a little over 320 people. This year, we've expanded that to a little over 600 employees around the world. And this has allowed us to ship new features, fix more bugs, improve the documentation, add a ton of learning and educational content, and support many more customers. Right? So it's very exciting for us. You'll see a lot of new HashiCorp faces around the conference as well. Talk to them. They'll be at the HashiCorp zone and cafe and booths around the event. And all of this is really made possible by a growing set of our customers. Our tools started out in some sense as an attempt to scratch our own itch a little over six years ago. And today, the open source tools are used from everyone from you know, individuals working in their garage on a new startup idea all the way to the largest Fortune 10 companies. And when you look at some of the commercial customers, they span that same range. Some of the world's largest and most recognizable com companies are now customers and use our tools to power their mission-critical workloads. So we're very excited and proud to be a part of that and work hard to ensure your success as well. So when we talk about what's driving this growth in both the HashiCorp user community as well as our customer base, it really goes to this sort of thesis we have that the world is going multi-everything, right? And when I say multi-everything, you know, the thing that probably comes to mind is multi-cloud. And that's, of course, sort of an important component of this, right? When we talk about multi-cloud, there is this sort of massive transition taking place where we're moving from traditional on-premise data centers into the public cloud, right? And you know, it might have been sort of a single cloud a few years ago, but what we're now seeing is there's sort of multiple uh, sort of major public clouds. And in general, we're seeing the world's largest companies adopt a multi-cloud strategy, right? It's not one of the above, it's sort of all of the above. But at the same time, it's not just a transition of where our things are running, it's what are we running, right? So we're also going multi-platform at the same time. If we looked at infrastructure five, 10 years ago, it was largely fairly homogenous. It was virtual machines, it was physical machines. That was sort of the abstraction we thought about, right? What's happened increasingly over the last few years is we've gone multi-platform as well, right? Now we think about containers as part of our mix, right? Increasingly, we're starting to think about serverless capabilities, whether that's function as a service, whether that's container as a service, whether that's higher level APIs sort of provided on demand. But it's no longer that we think about our infrastructure simply as a collection of VMs, right? There's more interesting technology that's part of that mix, right? So how does this change how we think about our approach? I think the last major shift is at an application architecture level, right? Not only is where we're running and what we're running, but the types of applications, the style of application is changing as well as we embrace microservices and service-oriented architectures, right? So we're moving away from the large monolithic service and we're decomposing that into many smaller services. Some of this is so we can get better code reuse, right? So we're not re-implementing the authentication or user service between our mobile API, our mobile front end, desktop front end, API front ends, right? So we can reuse logic between these different tiers. But part of it's so that we get greater agility, right? Different teams can work on different components. They can run independent of one another. And so we can parallelize the work that's taking place by splitting it out of the monolith, right? So all of these are kind of components of this kind of going multi story. And so our view is this sort of has a few different fundamental impacts to how we think about managing infrastructure. Right? At the base layer is how do we think about provisioning? Right? We're moving from a world where our assumption was dedicated fleets of machines that were relatively homogenous to on-demand capacity that's very heterogeneous. Right? It's going to be a mix of VM and container and serverless and functions, and all of that is going to be on-demand. When we think about the security layer, we're moving from a sort of perimeter-oriented IP-based security model where we said we're going to lock the front door use firewall rules, think in terms of IPs, to a world where we say, you know what, the IP is dynamic. We don't really know what it is. It's running in Kubernetes, right? My network is low trust because I have too many front doors. I'm operating in five different cloud environments, right? So we have to rethink our approach and think more about identity, right? What is the web service trying to do? Who should be allowed to access the database and not think about IPs? 
When you think about networking, we're also shifting away from the notion of a host. Right? It used to be that this machine is a web server, this machine is an API server or a database, right? where now we think about services. I don't really care what's running on that machine. I have hundreds of machines as part of my Nomad cluster. I don't really know what's running where. Right? What I care about is routing to the user service or the billing service. Right? And some of these services might not even exist until they get invoked. Right? If I'm running on a Lambda endpoint, there is no host. Until the invocation happens, I don't even know an IP. Right? So it's a different way of thinking around how do I route to a service as opposed to how do I route to a host. And then the final layer is at the runtime. We're moving away from dedicated fleets. These 50 machines are a web server. These 10 are a database to these much larger dynamic fleets that we're scheduling over. Right? So there's a bunch of changes in terms of the core assumptions of how we manage and run our infrastructure. Right? What this translates to in the landscape, then, is a ton of fragmentation. Right? You see a lot of different tools trying to solve each of these different pieces. There's a mix of open source and cloud native. And it's sort of hard to kind of see the forest, in some sense, for the trees here. And so our goal when we talk at HashiCorp is really, how do we provide a consistent way of operating across all of that? Right? We want a set of tools that are easy to use, that solve a specific problem, but that allow you to work across any of the environments you might be in. So it's great to talk about sort of the grand picture, how these pieces sort of fit together. But at the end of the day, that's not really how we think. That's not how we really solve problems on a day-to-day -day basis. Right? Where it really starts, it's with practitioners. It's folks like you who are trying to solve a specific problem. How do I provision something at Amazon? How do I secure a database credential? Right? So we're trying to solve these specific problems. And our design ethos at HashiCorp has always been pretty simple. It's build tools that we would want to use for these problems. Right? In some sense, we started by building for ourselves uh, and went from there. And so we strive to really make sure that simplicity is at the forefront of what we do, usability, and keeping the tools scoped to solving very specific problems. Right? If we succeed at that, we create a new set of problems. Right? Inevitably, if you get good at Terraform and you're happy with it and it's working well for you, you try and figure out, well, now how do I do this with my team members? How do I collaborate with other people? And this actually creates a new problem. Right? Collaboration is actually a different problem than the one you had when you started as an individual. So now this is something else we need to solve for. And if that goes well, right, and you scale it even larger to teams of teams or your organization, then you have an even different set of challenges, which is great. How do I do this now in a way that meets our governance and regulatory sort of ch standards and challenges as well? Right? So each of these is a great problem to have, right? uh, but they're different, ultimately. Mm -hmm.